I always need problems first before I think about solutions. We have a lot of challenge. We are working to keep our leadership on nuclear technology. Actually, it looks magic indeed when I, you see the, how we can go from very long-lived product to very short-lived. So why we are not doing that every day? Climate change and the increasing need for low-carbon energy have risen to the top of the agenda worldwide. Therefore, the European Union decided to act. A very important step has been the announcement of a strategic energy technology plan. It aims to support the development of new low-carbon technologies. Amongst others, this includes advanced nuclear fission involving more sustainable reactor technology and associated fuel cycles. As a result, European research is playing an important role in safeguarding the future of our planet. Since 1957, all European member states are signatories of the Eurotom Treaty. The European Atomic Energy Community supports nuclear research as part of the many activities promoting the peaceful use of nuclear energy. EU nuclear research is implemented by the European Commission through multi-annual framework programs. The seventh Eurotom Framework Programme runs from 2007 to 2011 with a total budget of 2.7 billion euros, including 300 million euros for R&D efforts in fission-related science and technology. This Eurotom funding supports research in various fields. Reactor systems including safety and the fuel cycle, radioactive waste management and radiation protection. Today's operating commercial reactors use established second-generation technology, which relies on reactors operating with thermalized or moderated neutrons and cooled by normal water under high pressure. These reactors produce about a third of Europe's electricity and avoid emissions of several hundred million tons of CO2 per year. Yves Calosny, responsible for international affairs and cooperation in the French Commissariat de l'Energie Atomique, CEA, is one of the key players in Europe's nuclear community. He knows that nuclear power has to be competitive, sustainable and safe in order to be attractive for industry and for society in general. Today we can say that we have a very competitive nuclear fleet in Europe with the Generation 2 reactor. Of course, under the pressure of licensing authority, there is some continuous progress in the safety of these reactors. That is a way to operate them. That is also to make some investments for safety upgrading, depending on the progress of the knowledge on this technology. Today, the EU has 145 nuclear reactors in operation across 16 countries. Currently, several new reactors are under construction in Bulgaria, Finland, France, Romania and Slovakia. Decisions on new build in the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Italy, Lithuania, Poland, Slovenia and the UK are pending. Belgium, Germany and Spain have phase-out policies for the moment. But the discussion over nuclear power isn't over. The Swedish government recently announced it would abandon its policy of phase-out. The expectations for upcoming nuclear technologies are high. For example, the European Pressurized Water Reactor, EPR. Europe's first evolutionary design, Generation 3 reactors, are currently under construction and will start operations within the next few years. But today's research is addressing even more advanced reactor systems. In parallel, we are developing Generation 4 reactor. Why? Because we can address the resource issue with the fast neutron reactor. We uh, multiply uh, the, the effectiveness of the use of uranium by a factor of 70. That means that today, with the same quantity of uranium, you extract 70 times more energy than with the present generation of reactor. 
For now, the EPR technology offers huge advances in terms of effective power production as well as in behavior under extreme safety-related events. By producing up to 1,600 megawatts of electricity, the new EPR reactor in Oikiloto, Finland will be the most powerful nuclear reactor in the world. Up to 4,000 people from 60 nations are working on the construction. The reactor is foreseen to start operation in 2012. Oikiloto 3 will supply millions of households and industry with energy for the coming 60 years. Radioactive waste is perceived as being one of the most challenging issues. European scientists are therefore concentrating their efforts in this field, both in research on reducing the actual amount of nuclear waste, as well as on implementing solutions for the safe disposal of all types of radioactive waste, in particular high-level and long-lived waste. At SCK CEN in Mol, Belgian scientists are investigating new ways to reduce the toxicity of spent fuel. Their research aims to transform the long-lived components of the spent fuel of reactors into shorter-lived or non-radioactive isotopes. The procedure is known as partitioning and transmutation. Partitioning is simply separating the different elements from each other. Then we get the uranium apart, plutonium separated, and also the minor actinide separated and the fission products. And we can even go further on by taking some of the particular fission product separated from the bulk of the fission product that we are creating. Technically, scientists have demonstrated at the laboratory scale that partitioning and transmutation can work. So far, only small quantities of radioactive isotopes, so-called minor actinides, have been treated. In the future, such procedures could reduce the length of time over which disposed waste remains radioactive. We take indeed that example of the iodine-129 isotope, which has a half-life time of 15 million years, if I remember. And actually, when we say we transmute it, means that we will be bombarding it with neutrons, we transform it into iodine-130, which then has a half-life time of only 12 hours. Research on advanced reprocessing contributes to the development of so-called closed fuel cycles for new fast neutron reactor systems. These future Generation 4 reactors offer the potential of vastly increased sustainability while producing much less high-level waste for disposal. Regardless of the success of such techniques, there will always be quantities of high-level and long-lived waste to be disposed of. The consensus is that the only safe long-term management option is deep geological disposal in stable rock formations. The first geological repositories are already on the way. One of the most advanced national programs can be found in Finland, in the municipality of Eurajoki. Here at Onkalo, the world's first deep geological repository for high-level radioactive waste is under construction. We started this work in 2004 with the start of construction, but right at the same time we also started the characterization activities here, which now have been going on for five, four, four, five years already. So we know a lot about the rock uh, from the depth already. We are there. Uh, at the depth of uh, 300 meters, more or less, and now we are approaching the, the actual host rock of the repository, and of course that's the most important part of it. The concept is based on the use of multiple barriers, which ensure that harmful quantities of radioactive material cannot leak into the host rock and eventually return to the biosphere, even over very long timescales. Disposal operations could start by 2020. By 2100, the repository could be full, access routes would be backfilled and sealed, ensuring the waste remains isolated for as long as the radioactive hazard exists.
To protect citizens from harmful exposure to ionizing radiation, European research aims at improving understanding of the effects of radiation. Radiation protection is a key consideration in all uses of nuclear technologies, including in the area of medical diagnosis and therapy. But what are the effects of ionizing radiation on the human body? In particular, more research is required on the risks of low and protracted doses of radiation. Critical is our understanding of the mechanisms involved in our DNA, our cells, our tissues and our entire body when they receive low doses of radiation. The only knowledge that we have are extrapolation. And the main difficulties is that we are dealing with effects that are not really detectable just after the exposure on the individual, but that will occur maybe 10 or 20 years after the exposure. The human body's response to radiation differs from one person to the next. What are the mechanisms involved? Who are those most at risk? To answer these fundamental questions, more research is needed. The vast majority of a typical person's yearly exposure is from naturally occurring radiation. For example, from natural radioactive material in the Earth or from cosmic radiation. However, there is an ever-increasing exposure resulting from medical applications such as diagnostic imaging and therapy, for example in the treatment of cancer. For some of us, the level of exposure can be significant. Every year, some 430,000 cases of breast cancer are diagnosed in Europe, of which 130,000 prove fatal. Earlier detection using improved diagnostic imaging techniques are an important weapon in our battle to reduce the mortality rate. Mammographies using standard X-ray techniques are today considered to be the state of the art in the detection of breast cancer. Improved imaging can be achieved using computer tomography. In Nuremberg, at the Institute of Medical Physics, new methods of diagnostic imaging will be developed. Professor Willy Kalender has dedicated his life and work to the field of CT. Currently, he's working on research aimed at developing dedicated breast CT for women. We can have what is in novel terms a one-stop shopping thing that we are aiming for. And I think that is very patient-friendly again here. In any case, as the breast is uh, under, kind of, through the table, under the table, the source and the detector will rotate under the table so the woman, the patient, doesn't see that and we take uh, the uh, data that way. So it is CT, but only CT of one body part, not of the whole body. His research is not only aiming towards a better quality of diagnostic imaging, but also at reducing the dose of radiation during the breast CT imaging. In most cases, or practically all cases, we can limit it to below uh, the natural uh, background radiation dose level. For example, in uh, this breast CT project, we want to stay below a dose of 2.4 millisievert. This report has presented just a fraction of the research effort underway in Europe. In particular, the Eurotum program aims to strengthen cooperation between member states and industry in all these fields for the benefit and welfare of European citizens. This research is essential if we are to develop technology solutions for a better future. <laughs>